Good morning. Welcome to Center for Spiritual Living Reading via Facebook Live and later on YouTube podcast. Thank you, Lindy, for running the show back there. So we're here in service today. Uh, we're going to open with a song that uh, Dalton recorded for us. So uh, take this in as you uh, listen to our Dalton. I build my life on the rock of spirit. I build my life on the rock of prayer. I build my life on the rock of and I know that God is always there I build my life with a sense of purpose There will be no shifting sands I build my life on the rock of spirit So I'm held by His loving hands I build my life on the rock of spirit I build my life on the rock of prayer I build my life on the rock of God is always there. I build my life with a sense of purpose. There will be no shifting sands. I build my life on the rock of spirit. So I build by his loving hands. I build my life on the rock of spirit. I build my life on the rock of prayer. I build my life on the rock of me smile. I pictured all of us uh, on retreat together in Hawaii somewhere on a private beach just moving our hips and dancing with each other because COVID's over. That's where I went with that. Uh, thank you Dalton. Always a joy. So um, I'm just going to briefly share a few things with you. We have the uh, women's and men's group meeting tomorrow night via Zoom. I'll be sending out an invitation this, this afternoon for the women, and if you want to connect with uh, the men's group, Roy is the one that you want to contact for that. And the women are starting to look at a book that um, Megan Dawn is a woman that I've met at Bioneers, and she wrote a new book called The New Divine Feminine. So we're going to explore some of those readings together. That's what we're doing tomorrow night, and uh, the men, as always, have deep discussions and sharing, creating deeper friendships with one another. Later on this month, I wanted to inform you that I'll be doing a workshop called Facing Anxiety and Stress. This is going to be a workshop from 9 to noon via Zoom. Yeah, I kind of had a little dance with that. Where's my ukulele? The, the Learn Insights on Dealing with Your Anxiety, and I'm going to be using a lot of techniques from um, heart math and also uh, from my years of yoga practice to help us find some tools that will help get us on the other side of some of those anxious thoughts that can stir, especially during this last year, and make 2021 a much better experience for all of us. So that is, if you want to mark your calendar and let me know you want a Zoom invite, I have some information I want to be able to give you ahead of time. So January 30th, it's a Saturday from 9 to noon. And also, don't forget, our midweek pickup calls via Zoom is kind of a time to pour a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and join together with, with other members to, to just kind of chat about what's going on in your world. We're a great support for one another, and those, um, the people that have been continually showing up on those calls have become very deep friends in that process. So join us and be a part of that. We'd appreciate it. And you can get the invitation for that from Lori. She's happy to send that out. Well, that's all we're going to share right now. And we're going to move on into um, sound, sounding the bell after I do a short reading. And then we have Judy here to offer some of her beautiful music while we do a prayer. Dr. Mary is giving our message today 
grounding beyond the beginning. So the reading today comes from the foreword of The Science of Mind, one of the texts where are uh, written by Jean Houston, and very profound uh, reading to at this time. In the Science of Mind text, Holmes seems to anticipate the world of the new millennium with its compounding factors unique to human experience. How can we deal with the world in the throes of whole system transition in which everything that we have known is changing at such a rapid pace that we are caught between the dangers that threaten us and the opportunities that beckon us. Think on that. We are called to be re-educated, to use more of our creative selves in meeting the many new challenges that confront us. It is that for which we have been created. We are required as a species to extend ourselves into radically new ways of being. The tasks that are, are, that are now ours, the tasks of virtual creation, compel the revolution in consciousness that tells us that we are part of the great unfolding of spirit in flesh. These are the times we are the people. Wisdom from Jean Houston. And the wisdom of Jean in her introduction to the Science of Mind text takes us now into prayer as we listen to the bell and now the beautiful music. We begin to soften into the ground beneath us and we let go of any hardened point of view, any sense of judgment or being right and we just open to what is. We open to awareness itself, and we allow that blessing of awareness to simply envelop each and every one of our hearts in such a way that we are open, open and filled with a divine love that operates through us, as us, for us. And we use the information that we glean from today's message to deepen and to empower our way as we feel more grounded through this teaching, through this philosophy, through this wisdom of all time, this truth, this principle. And we allow this now just to be the grace that moves us through these times. I give thanks for the community that is sharing in this moment of awakening. I give thanks for the, the courage and the bravery of so many people that are taking care of events that happened in this past week. As we rise above, as we rise above with hearts full of intention to allow the greater good to continue to unfold in all life. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And so it is. Dr. Mary. Thank you, Judy. Good morning. Let me put that down a little bit. There we go. I'm so glad you're with us this morning. In most centers for spiritual living, January is the month where we go back to basics. And in the basics of the science of mind teaching, the first four chapters of the book are the basics. The rest of the book just supports the first four chapters, if you didn't know that. <laughs> and so the title kind of threw me when it said, Grounding Beyond the Beginning. Okay. I know what grounding is. It's studying the fundamentals of a field of knowledge. And for us, our field of knowledge is the power of our mind. It's the energy, the emotions, the beliefs, the thoughts that are all flowing through our mind that kickstart the creative process in our lives. You know, this energy follows the path of natural laws that are always operating. Natural laws. In the foreword to the 50th 
anniversary edition uh, published in 1988. I really enjoyed this opening. Um, it was written by William Hornaday. And he wrote that there was a time in his life when he just didn't know where he was going. He was searching desperately for answers. And he had attended a couple of Dr. Holmes lectures and he thought, I'll just make an appointment with him and see if he has any thoughts about this. So when he went to meet Dr. Holmes, he was, Dr. Holmes was so nice and so opening. And Hornaday didn't know that his nickname, uh, Dr. Holmes' nickname was Happy. He's always very, very, very happy. And so they talked a little bit, and then Holmes said, what I really want to know is if you're happy with the results of your beliefs. Are you satisfied with where you're going in life? And Hornaday had to say, I don't know. And Holmes said, you know, something within you does know. So let's explore together and we'll find it. Holmes described this science of mind as a correlation of the laws of science, opinions of philosophy, revelations of religions, and it combined the wisdom of the ages. He studied all the great spiritual texts, and it offers a key, a universal key to our well-being, which can be used by us anytime, any place, anywhere. When Hornaday opened the Science of Mind text, he saw the dedication. And Holmes' dedication was to the truth which frees us and sets us on a pathway of a new experience, which enables us to see through the mists to the eternal and changeless reality. Hornaday was very impressed at those far-reaching promises that he hoped was true, that he would find these in the text. Then he read, the essential premise of this philosophy is, and I know you've heard this, there is one life. That is God's life. That life is perfect, and that life is my life now. I bet you can even sing that. <laughs> because there is this power in the universe greater than we are, and because our life is part of that, we can use it. Eventually, Hornaday became one, of, uh, became one of Holmes' most ardent supporters. He became a minister, and he was a prolific writer supporting this philosophy. If you want a really special Science of Mind text, in 2012, a deluxe edition was published, and it has a leather cover, and it has not only the text, but the concordance behind it where you, look, you can look up any word and find where it is in the text. And the foreword was written by Jean Houston, and part of that was the opening reading. She shared that the science of mind philosophy was the practical emph emphasis, had a practical emphasis on grounding ourselves in the power of trained thought. She wrote, instead of living a life of habitual patterns, we can renew our mind because what goes on in our mind impacts our bodies and our soul. Science of Mind gives clear direction on how to build a matrix of using this mind. And the result manifest, resulting manifestations are, uh, as Jean said it this way, how to activate and orchestrate our thoughts and emotions toward higher purposes that we're looking for and for the creative results we'd like to experience. Now, why wouldn't you want to delve into this beautiful philosophy? So the basics are the first four chapters of the text. Chapter one is entitled, The Thing Itself. That's how Holmes describes God, the thing. Now, he did this in 1926 to jar traditional beliefs that God was a man in the sky sitting on a throne, uh, ready to send us to heaven or hell when we die. Very judgmental. And Holmes discovered in the great spiritual texts that these natural laws operating through the universe can be trusted. And they're operating 24-7. 
in, through, and around us. And that God, the thing, is universal creative energy based on love and law. So it's true, we live in a spiritual universe, but there's nothing supernatural about it. It's this creative energy we call this energy field, universal mind, it has no limits. Our individual minds, every time we use them, we're using that creative process. It's really impersonal because it reacts to us based on what we are saying to ourselves. It doesn't judge us. It doesn't say, oh man, what a stupid idea. Thank God, thank God. <laughs> But it attracts like energy into our experience. So the new thought adage is, to learn how to think is to learn how to live. I wanted to read you a shortened version of a poem that was written by the third patriarch of Zen in somewhere between 575 and 615. That was quite a long time ago. But I think you're going to like these little snippets of this poem. The great way is not difficult for those who are not attached to preferences. You might have heard that before. Where neither love nor hate arises, all is clear. Separate, separate that by even the smallest amount, and you are as far from heaven as it is from hell. If you wish to know the truth, then hold no opinions against anything, against or for anything. To set up what you like against what you dislike is a disease of the mind. When the fundamental nature of things is not recognized, the mind's essential peace is disturbed to no avail. When you try to stop activity to achieve quietude, your very effort fills you with activity. So do not remain in a dualistic state. Avoid the easy habits carefully. If you attach even a trace of this, in the, of, this of right and wrong, the mind's essence will be lost in confusion. When the mind exists undisturbed in the way, there is no objection to anything in the world. So I truly believe that life as expressed in this example, is the most challenging thing in front of us for the new year. If you want to know the truth, then hold no opinions for or against anything. To set up what you like against what you dislike is a disease of the mind. Things to consider, things to consider. So now we go to chapter two in the textbook, and it's called The Way It Works, The Way God Works. Like I said, these are natural laws or principles to guide the that guide the creative energy. For instance, one of these laws is the law of gravity, which is a natural force that keeps things falling down. If I drop this to the ground, it would fall down because of the nature of gravity. It also keeps us from flying off into space when our uh, favorite team makes a touchdown and we jump up and go, yay. <laughs> I do that a lot lately. I watch a lot of football lately. <laughs> You've heard the equation E equals MC squared. E being energy is equal to M, its mass, times the speed of light squared. Einstein. On the most basic level, the equation says that energy and mass, like this podium or any piece of things that we see, are interchangeable that they're different forms of the same thing. Ah, something about the energy of our mind and things. It's always at work. The energy contains our thoughts and beliefs and it's at work in the creative process. Now, I may be sounding redundant, but it's important. Yes, it's redundant because sometimes it's hard to, to really grasp that. So whether we're thinking loving thoughts or anger and judgment, we need to think about that. And we've heard a lot of anger and judgment and condemnation this past week. Because the law of cause and effect states that an action is always accompanied by or quickly followed by consequences. 
There's a reason for everything that happens. For every effect, there is a cause, whether we know it or not. And it's subbed up by Jesus. It is done to us as we believe. So how much anger or condemnation or judgment do you want in your life? Or would you like a little more loving kindness? I think that would be better. So if we're suffering, it's not because suffering's been imposed on us by other people or the media. <laughs> it's because we aren't paying attention to our true nature. The thing works for us by working through us. Our beliefs set the limit to our experience, and the ignorance of that knowledge is no excuse. You may remember the story in Matthew 25, uh, lines 14 to 30. It's about a man who goes on a long trip, and he calls his servants together, and he entrusts his money to them. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last. He divided it in proportion to his understanding of their individual abilities. Then he left on his trip. But when he came back, the servant who received the five bags of silver, when he left, the servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and he earned five more. The servant who was given two bags of silver earned two more. And the servant given one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and buried it because he didn't want to lose it. So eventually the master returns and he asks them for what they did with his money. So the servant, or the servant who had the five, five bags said, Master, I've earned five more bags. And the master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this money and you will get many more responsibilities here. The servant who received two bags said, Master, you gave me two bags, and I earned two more bags of silver. And the master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've managed this well, and so over time I will make you ruler over many things. The servant with one bag of silver said, You know, Master, I knew you were a harsh man. You were reaping things that you didn't sow, so I was afraid. And... I hid your bag in the ground, and he gave the bag back. The master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. Why didn't you just deposit my money with the bankers? At least I would have gotten some interest. So he banished him. And the moral of the story is, to those who use well what we are given, what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Hmm. I relate this parable to the way it works, the way God works. We have this natural creative process. When we use it well, amazing things happen. But if we don't use it, if we ignore it, and let negativity take over, we ex experience the results because our ignorance of the law is no excuse. So now on to chapter three, what it does. I know it sounds redundant, hang in there with me, because the simplest way to explain this is we are surrounded by infinite intelligence that knows everything. It's the essence of beauty, truth, wisdom, and love. We exist in it, it's all around us. We draw from it through the channel of our own mind. Our own minds are cause, and we experience the effects. Now let me give you an example. I love this, and it's a true story. <laughs> it's my all-time favorite example of the power of our mind. One of our practitioners said for two or three months, I need a new car. My car is unreliable. I just can't afford it, I just need a new car. And it wasn't long before she was driving down the street and her car caught on fire. And she got out and watched it burn up. And the insurance company got her a new car. I think that's just the best. 
But another practitioner kept sharing, you know, I'm so overwhelmed with my job. It's so stressful. I need a break. I just, I just need a break. And it wasn't long before she tripped over one of these cement blocks in a parking lot and broke her shoulder. So she got her break. So our beliefs are causal, cause, causal. And an emotion such as fear of driving in an unreliable car, that's pretty heavy emotion. The emotion of being overwhelmed by stress on a job, these create these effects, cause, fear, and effect. Well, I have a beautiful cause and effect to share with you. And it, was, it happened to me, I thought I better say something about myself. When I moved to Reading and came here and learned and studied, uh, it was before I was a practitioner. I was divorced. It was long before I met my husband. And I went to a practitioner for a treatment about my mother. She had cancer. And when we were done with that, the practitioner said, well, Mary, you're single. Are you in a relationship? How's, how's the relationship going? And I said, you know, I feel really comfortable. I'm not looking for a relationship. I'm really comfortable with life. And she said, aha, then you're not drawing the wrong relationship. How about if I do a treatment for the right and perfect relationship? And I said, okay. And within a couple of weeks, I met my soulmate, who's now my husband. We've been together 25 years. It's hard to imagine. So practitioner training calls certain people. It's a very, very powerful practice. Uh, a practitioner is trained to look at the effects in your life and talk to you, kind of go back and see where the cause was. What was the belief that would trigger such effect? And then when cause is identified, they do a spiritual mind treatment to put a new road of, in your consciousness. Car we call it carving a new road in your consciousness. When I was uh, in that place of not having a relationship, I look at myself at that time being in a neutral zone. And so what the practitioner did was kickstart the energy through that treatment for me to find this perfect relationship. So it takes a lot of training to know how to do that. And we have a wonderful program for that. It's quite an achievement to get your license as a practitioner then that can cause new roads in your consciousness. It require, requires taking six classes just to get into practitioner training, and that's followed by 60 weeks of training over two years. And then you have to pass a test, and then you have to pass an oral panel. But it's a lot, but every time as a practitioner I do a treatment for someone, I am just filled with immeasurable joy. My whole system comes alive. I feel like I'm floating it's such a powerful thing. So that's about what it does. Now, how to use it. Chapter four, how to use it. Holmes wrote that, you know, okay, students, you guys like to read, otherwise you wouldn't be in this, this philosophy. But sometimes you can do too much studying and not enough practicing. Because we can only know the power of treatment by actual demonstration by actually seeing the effect and going, oh my God, I was the cause. And hopefully good, good cause. So I'll, do, I'll give you another example. Robin Backstrom is one of our wonderful practitioners and she's been on our team for a while. And a few months ago when the wildfires were raging, she asked the practitioner team to pray for their cabin in the mountains because the fire was getting close. And so we did, and after the fire was out, she and her husband went to the cabin to see what they expected would be totally devastation, total devastation. The four cabins near theirs were totally destroyed, and the fire walked around their cabin and left it totally intact. Now she shared that her husband was jumping up and down, thank God for gravity, uh, and he said, it's a miracle, it's a miracle, and Robin just smiled. She knew. I love that story. <laughs> so in this philosophy, Dr. Holmes created this effective way to use cause and effect through scientific prayer. 
we call it spiritual mind treatment, and it was proven to be more effective than regular traditional Christian prayer or no prayer at all. And this double-blind study was conducted at the University of Redlands in 1951, quite some time ago. And you'd think it's so powerful it would be used everywhere. But that's the nature of taking on the immense understanding of where we are in the world. It's a five-step process where we align our mind with the thing, God, and then we align our mind with being part of that, that essence being everywhere around us. And then we state the essence of our desire and how it would feel, the emotion, how it would feel when we get that object of our desire, that person or whatever. And then we offer gratitude. We've put it into the hands of the universe and now we are grateful. It's on its way. And then we, relet we let go. We just let go. Very powerful practice. And so I'd like to end this talk with a prayer and look for the five steps. God, I am one with that. I accept for myself or I'll accept for you. I give thanks and so it is. And Judy, thank you for being here. It's true. The thing itself, this thing we call God, created all, created everything. Our mind is challenged to wrap around that, but we see as we dig into this philosophy and see it from the wisdom of the ages, that there is this universal energy that has created everything. And if it created everything, it created us. The first line in the Bible practically is the word of God. And isn't it interesting that our word is how we tap into that creative process, that same creative process. So you and I, the person next to you, the person around in Brazil or Paris, we're all children of the one, created by the one. And now as I've kind of amped up my energy and I'm feeling really excited about this, I can accept the power that's there in the universe. I can accept it in my life and in yours to be at peace in the world, to let go of anxiety, to let go of fear, to let go of condemnation because everything is working out. Cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. We see effect and we want to condemn it and we forget about the cause. The cause is in the minds of many. And so I accept for myself and you today a peaceful cause, appreciating this life, appreciating who we are, and sharing this life in kindness, joy, happiness. I accept that for you and for me. And as I put that energy in motion, I can say thank you. Thank you. E equals MC squared. That energy, that light moves at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second. It's there, it's moving, it's drawing to you and to me like energy. That's why I'm so grateful. And now I can relax. It's in motion. And so it is. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. And thank you, Dr. Mary. That's it in a nutshell. Isn't that great? That's amazing. We used to take a whole month to say what you said in, in that little bit of short time, but it was, it was packed with information and truth to carry us forward. I was reading something this morning. Uh, Ram Dass was 
so brilliant in, in sharing these, these great wisdom stories and the one where you just keep saying, oh, so, whatever comes your way, good or bad, oh, so, not to run away from what it is, but to drop into what it is and to uh, make a choice right then. And so with these events of past, the past week, oh, so, what is my challenge here? What is my to do? And there's so much wisdom in today's talk and realizing we're co-creating. Let us fill the space, the atmosphere with positive, thoughtful change with great love. And uh, it's, it's what we can do. We are the ones. So I'm, I'm empowered by the talk today and, and by the wisdom and by who we all are as a community. We're going to lift this all to a higher good. It begins with us. So with that being said, I want you to stand. I know you're in your jammies, but get up. I know, grunt, grunt. But let's repeat this. There's only one life. That life is God's life. That life is perfect. That life is my life now. Okay, now stretch a little bit and take a breath and say it with a little more empowerment. I don't care if somebody's in the other room and thinks you're foolish. Draw them in. There's only one life. That life is God's life. That life is perfect. That life is my life now. And so it is. So with great gratitude for the many gifts that uh, continue to arrive through the center to keep us um, financially stable, we give our heartfelt thanks for that. And um, all donations are received with such love. And they continue to then move back out into our community. So gratefully, we remember that as we give with an attitude of abundance, that as we give, we do receive, just as the parable expressed. So that's a wrap up. We are, as practitioners and ministers here, always in service to you. If, um, if you're finding yourself in a, in a sense of needing some spiritual support, please email or call and just let us hear from you. We will respond with prayer and love. So I'm going to... Um, invite the last closing song from our Dalton. Thank you again. And here, here we go.
you, Dalton. What a perfect song to end this crazy week. So to all of the, all the people, to every Democrat, to every Republican, to every Independent, to all of us, we're waiting in that field to meet again as one. Thank you, Dalton. Have a beautiful week, everyone.